beinglibertarian.com is a website for minarchists, classic liberals, anarchists, independents, capitalists, and right-left-leaning libertarians. The goal of the website is to debunk, discredit as much authoritarian and status propaganda as possible while spreading the message of freedom and liberty to the world. We welcome you to our website and ask you to provide thoughtful insight in the comments and share our world on social media. Thank you, friends of liberty. Please visit beinglibertarian.com. The, the way the Randians use the word capitalism as a synonym for libertarianism, I think, is a little bit of a stretch. I do think that in any advanced cosmopolitan society that has a free market, you would tend to have capitalism arise. But capitalism is just one one aspect of the economic aspect of a libertarian society. Information is free. The law will put the Johnny Rocket Lunch Pad. And now, here's Johnny! A Monday warrior, mean, mean stride. Today's Tom Sawyer, mean, mean pride. Hey, it's Johnny Rocket here at the Johnny Rocket Launch Pad. Always launching ideas in your direction. The Northwest only rock and roll libertarian radio show. I'm here with my co-host, Kurt Nelson. Ha <laughs> ha, thank you, sir. And my voice for reason, the beautiful, sexy Heather Nixon. Thank you so much, Kurt. And he was host, Johnny Rocket. Always launching ideas, and it's liberty ideas. This is what this show's about. We're here to try to spread that message of liberty. And you know what? We're spreading this message in a time where it needs it the most. Got some sad news. Heather's mom. Why don't you explain the story? This is your mom. Well, it's not sad anymore. She, it was a little traumatic at first. Traumatic, that's yeah. a better word. Yeah, but it's still sad though. We, we yeah. learned she had a tumor that was growing in her head. It was the size of a plum. She had her surgery yesterday. They were able to remove all of it. Oh. It is completely benign. So now oh, we just great ha- news. She she is not feeling so well. It's going to be tough work for the recovery, but she's going to do well. And oh, I know so, just like yeah. the, anything to do with the eyeball or the brain <laughs> fucks me up. I'm like, but, ah. come on, technology though, man. That they can I know. move. Yeah, that. I know. Yeah, I know. Technology is great. The last three weeks have been sort of a roller coaster, and life has sort of been on hold. But now she's at her surgery, and now we can get her better and move on. So, and thank you to everyone who wished her well on Facebook. I very much appreciate the support and she appreciated me reading her the comments. So thank you. We would still like messages for Heather's mom. Yes. Prayers, good juju, whatever you believe yeah. in. Yep. Yeah, so let's keep them coming in. Thank you guys very much. And it was those Johnny Rocket guys. We got a cool fucking guest. We do. This could be like a killer guest. This guy knows shit. Like a lot of shit. No, That's he, awesome. He doesn't like, he knows. <laughs> the, it was kind of two different things. Wait, say that be again. careful. Okay, careful. Well, so what I'm saying is he knows a lot of shit. A lot of shit. A lot of shit. <laughs> right. It's good shit. Right. We all should know as libertarians. Some people know shit, but he knows a lot of shit. A, a right. lot of shit. Right. He's really good. He's a, good a smart shit. guy. Good shit. Good shit. Good shit. This is the episode about shit. This guest, you guys ready for this fucking badass guy? Let us have it. This individual is the founder and executive editor of the Libertarian Papers. Founder and director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. A senior fellow of the Mises Institute. A member of the editorial board of Reason Papers. A member of the editorial advisory board, Molinari Review. A member of the advisory board of the Lexington Books series, Capitalist Thought, Studies in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. A member of the advisory council of the Government Waste and Overregulation Council of Our America Initiative. And legal advisor to the LBRY. This individual is a registered patent attorney and a former adjunct professor at South Texas College of Law. This individual has published numerous articles and books on IP law, international law, and the application of libertarian principles to legal topics. This individual has received an LLM in international business law from King's College London, a JD from the Paul M. Herbert Law Center at LSU, a BSEE and an MSEE degrees from LSU. I welcome here on the launch pad, Stefan Kinsella! Man. 
man. Thanks for being with us today, man. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guys. What a great intro. That, that cool? Like, there's explosions. Yeah. <laughs> Bam! And, you, and yeah. you said his name right. I did say That's your name That's important. Right. Yes. Yeah, but you, you said he bear instead of a bear. It's Louisiana name, a bear. Paul was a bear law school. Okay, well, I lived I lived in Louisiana for a while, but we're not going to talk about that. We're talking about you, Stefan. Thank you very much for coming on the show. I have a little pre-story before we start this interview, but I actually heard you on the Tom Woods show. And man, what you had to say was fantastic. I'm like, I got to get this guy on our show because this guy is just a vat of knowledge. What I really want to talk to you about is, you know, I'm going to kind of start with what kind of intrigued me with what you had to say on Tom Woods. But what are some of the fallacies in modern libertarian thought? And what are your theories? Hmm. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. So we're not going to talk about intellectual property theory right away, which is what I usually get asked. And that's fine. I I do think I've learned a few things over the years, even though I am from Louisiana. It's kind of hard to learn when you're from that state. (laughs) You guys, you just got the internet. It's like a new thing. (laughs) Just kidding. I love my home state from Texas, you know. Right. Uh, (laughs) Kurt wish he was from Texas. I do. I wish he's I was from like Texas. Alaska. Oh yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm from Alaska. So if you think your internet connection's bad, go to Alaska. <laughs> You're really fucked. Yeah, I think we should have Texit here. Right? <laughs> maybe uh, what would Alexit from Alaska? Uh, we should, we yes, should all have an, uh, some kind of exit uh, exit plan. Uh, oh man, there's a lot of fallacies. Of course, I have gradually become an anarchist, libertarian, and so from that perspective. So I think that one, like one of the fallacies. Oh, okay. So let, let's go with let's go with the basic one. The word property. Okay. So pe- like I talk about intellectual property a lot, and so people trying to rephrase this argument, they'll say that ideas aren't property. But I don't think that's the right way to look at it. The question is not whether something is is or is not property. The word, so the word property really is just a description of a relationship between an owner and a thing. So we say that if you own a chair or a car or a house that you have a property right in that thing. Uh-huh. So it's a resource, but to call it property is a little bit confusing because you know I have a property right in that thing. So the sure. question is never, is, is that thing property? The question is, when there's a thing that people have a dispute over, who is the owner? That's the only question. The question is, who's the owner, not is it property? So that's one, I think, mistake libertarians make, and it leads them astray. Interesting. Okay, yeah. I think another could be over-reliance on metaphors and sloppy thinking and sloppy language. So, for example, we're used to the idea from Locke that you own the fruit of your labors, but that's really just a metaphor. The the fruit of your labor is not really a literal thing that you own. You Mm -hmm. don't really own the fruit of anything or of your labors, so you don't own your labor. You don't own your action. This is another big mistake I think people make, and it leads to the intellectual property way of thinking. Because if you believe that you own not only your body, which is, I think, what self-ownership properly is supposed to mean, right. you own your body, then you also own your actions or your labor, the things you do with your body. I think that's a mistake. I think it's like double counting, and it leads to confusion because if you believe you own your labor, then you think there's this sort of substance called labor that kind of emanates from or flows from your body that you own. And when it mixes into other things, then you own those things that you mix with it, right? That's how like Locke described it, uh, and that leads that leads to the idea of intellectual property. If you create something that you labored to create with your mental labor, then you have a property right in that thing, and that's a big mistake, I think. What about owning your time? Yeah, I think that's another mistake. I don't think you own your time. I don't think time is technically speaking a scarce resource. And the uh, economists say this. Because they they view it as a factor, right, that that goes into production. But it's not really a resource that you can own. Time is just the passing of events. So philosophically, I don't think that time is a resource that you can actually have a property right over. What is it when when we have a job then? How would you describe it if if we're not selling our labor or selling our time? Yeah, right. That, that's a, that's exactly the right next question to ask, and that's another mistake. When people, so uh, I, I adhere to what the Rothbardian and the Williams and Evers view of contract theory, which is really a revolutionary theory of Rothbard came up with, which I think uh, is underappreciated in how momentous it is. But basically, his view of contract is that contract is simply the exercise of an owner of a resource that you own and to transfer it to someone else by the consent of the owner. So that's what a contract is. It's not really what we conceive of contract is normally as a binding promise. Okay, so 
a labor contract or, or a sale contract or an employment contract. Well, first of all, people misunderstand this. They they usually assume that when you work for someone, you have a contract. You don't really usually have a contract. I mean, most of us have had jobs, and we don't really have an agreement at all except an agreement upon the price that you're going to be paid. Yeah, you fill out an application. They say you're hired, and 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 that's it. Yeah, and they say we're going to pay you, you know, twelve seventy five an hour, and that's it. Mm-hmm. And then they can fire you when they want to, and you can quit when you want, and that's all there is to it. Sure. And if you perform thirteen hours of work, then they owe you thirteen hours of pay. That's the only contract. Everyone acts like it's something more elaborate than that. It's usually not more elaborate than that, unless you're the CEO of like HP or something like that, and you negotiate something more complicated. So most times, a contract is just a payment of money to someone. You can say in exchange, which is an economic concept, in exchange for them performing some labor. But that doesn't really mean you literally sell the labor. We describe it that way in analogy to our to a normal transaction, right? Or normal exchange, which would be, you know, I give you an apple, you give me a pear. Mm-hmm. So we're exchanging two things. So I'm giving you one thing, you're giving me another, and the title is transferring. But not every contract and not every exchange involves a mutual or a bilateral transfer of titles. Sometimes it's just one way. For, so, for example, if I pay you a dollar to sing a song for me, you know, then I'm giving you title to money in exchange for something that I value, but you're not giving me title to anything in exchange. I'm just hearing something that pleases me. So not every contract, not every exchange is a two-way exchange of title. And the same is true in the employment context. If, if I perform a service for you, then you're giving me money to get something that you want, which is for me to perform certain actions with my body. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean I'm literally selling to you my labor as if I own the labor and I'm transferring the title to that labor to you. So so then what is the economic thing of value that is transferring? Well, see, value is in, in, in Austrian terms and economic terms, value is a subjective concept, right? Sure. So sure value is. is just what you is just what you value. So so for example, every action that we engage in, according to Mises and praxeology and the, the study of human action, every action is aimed at achieving some kind of end, some kind of result that you want to to be the case sure. in the future. It doesn't always have to be the ownership of an item. It could be something else. I, you know, I could engage in uh, libertarian activism to achieve a, a more peaceful world, or I could in, engage in fundraising for cancer to try to cure cancer. But if I'm successful, the end of my action will not be something that I own. It will just be a changed state of affairs that I preferred to happen. So what I value is what I was aiming at. Right. So you don't okay. always have to value something that you're going to own. Sometimes you can. If I buy a chocolate bar from the grocery store, the end of my action is to obtain the ownership of a chocolate bar. And the reason is, you know, so I can enjoy it or whatever. Mm-hmm. But the end of my action is not always to obtain ownership or title to something. It could be to see a smile on a girl's face or, you know, to uh, if I do a, a weather dance, it could be to make the make make it stop raining. <laughs> whatever. Uh, sir, sir, I've seen this. But like, but for example, Example, like I think this is a great analogy. So let's just say I want to go to a movie theater, right? I pay twenty dollars for me and Heather and Kurt, or maybe more than that now, thirty dollars <laughs> yeah, for all it. three of us to go see the new X Men movie or whatever, right? We go to the movie yeah. theater and we are not buying the movie; we're buying the viewing of the movie. We're buying. We're not getting anything out of it. The entertainment. Yeah, we're getting the entertainment value. We're not actually getting the movie. There's no hard copy in our hands when I bought when we went to see the movie. You're not leaving with anything. No. Right. We're not leaving with anything. Is that a good right. analogy? It's a good. It's a very good analogy. So I think that so in that case, it's a, it's it's a unilateral transfer of look. It, you're transferring title to your money to the movie studio right. or to the theater. So that is a, a transfer of title to some property that you own or some resource that you have a property right. Okay. Um, now look, if you give twenty dollars to your nephew as a as a as a birthday gift, you're also transferring. It's a gift. Right. But in in both cases, it's a unilateral transfer of title. In one case, you're doing it to receive something in return. In the other, you're you're not unless you want your nephew's gratitude. And in the case of seeing the movie, what you want in return is the experience of seeing the movie. But it's not that you own it. I would say that for the temporary duration of the movie, as you're in the theater. You're physically renting the space, basically. So you do have some kind of limited property right in the physical movie space. But right. I think the reason we say that – so if someone says, well, I, I, I spent $20 – 
what did I buy with it? They're making an analogy to a regular exchange, right? In which case, I give you twenty dollars and you give me uh, tw- you know, five apples or something like that. Sure. So that's what they're analogizing it to. So they're, what what they're what they're really saying is, I sold my labor services for my job, or I bought the experience of watching a movie for twenty dollars. They're just explaining in sort of praxeological terms what the motivation was of why did you give up the why did you give up the twenty dollars? You gave it up to achieve a certain end, and that was to watch a movie. And you can just say colloquially, I bought the movie, but you didn't really buy a movie because you don't have a title to anything afterwards. You just have a memory. Well you could have bought the tickets. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, <laughs> so you own those little pieces of you paper. Own, you, you paid twenty dollars for those tickets, and which those tickets mean something. The, else. the, the value of those, the values, sure, sure, sure. yeah, you know, whatever. We can go on forever on that. Hey, we're going to take a quick commercial break. Make sure you have your tampons and your aspirin, and uh, we'll be right back. Johnny Rocket from the Johnny Rocket Launchpad. You know what, guys? I am not one for seminars or, and, or any of this motivational training bullshit. But you know what? After taking the Libertarian Leadership course, well, I've changed my mind. This course was fantastic. It really engaged me and other members of the group in different ways of leading. You know, everyone is different, and the Libertarian Leadership course is there to help you find your personal style of winning. You know what? And influencing. That is really the perfect fit for you. Everybody is different. We all walk to a different drum. We all know this. And this course was designed to be flexible for any personality type. Not only does this course show you ways to motivate and inspire people, it also teaches you to train and coach future members and leaders of the Libertarian Party. Schedule a call today to find out how they can bring their revolutionary training to your city. Take your first step in challenging the status quo. Visit libertarianleadership.org. But like you were talking on the Tom Woods show, and I really wanted you to kind of talk about this on this show. I think it's fantastic regarding suing and how we've come into a sue happy society. Everyone wants to sue people. Hey, I don't like you. I'm going to sue you. And you said that libertarians also get this wrong about how they view litigation. One thing I noticed that that people get wrong all the time, libertarians and others, uh, someone will ask me, if I do the following, can someone sue me for it? And I'm, well, you know, the answer is yes. Anyone, you can be sued at any time. What you're really asking is, will you lose, right? Or will it be easy to win if, if you want to put up a defense? So you, being sued doesn't mean that you're going to lose. It just means someone has the right to bring you to trial. Right. The The problem with the current system, well, there's many problems with it. One problem is that the entire system we the, the system we have now is almost entirely based upon legislation instead of instead of just principles of justice, which which is really what the common law used to be geared at trying to find, trying to find results in a case where there's a, a dispute between two or more people and the, the judge and the court would try to find a just result. And over time, those principles congealed in the common law. And there was another system in the Roman law, which is similar. Mm-hmm. Now we have legislation. So in most cases, you just look at the at the legislation that is just words written down by a legislature, and that's the answer to the case. So the dispute is no longer about justice. It's about what words mean. Right. So the, the only question is, you know, did you do A, B, and C if that's what the statute prescribes? Right. It's got nothing to do with justice anymore. So the job of judges is no longer to, to try to find a just result. The job of jurors is no longer to find a just result. They're just interpreting statutes. Okay. okay. So that's one huge problem with the modern law is that it's no longer the attempt to find justice. It's an attempt to just interpret words that someone else just announced, some, some, some committee. And it corrupts the way everyone views law. So everyone now thinks of law as things that have to be written down and announced by the sovereign, and that we call this legal positivism. It's just the view that law is what some sovereign decrees. And of course, that gets everyone in thinking like having the mindset of serfs. We obey the rules of the person that decrees what the rules are. And the only question is, what are the rules that the current ruler has laid down for us? Interesting. Okay, so this is very, very dangerous. So that's one problem. Now, a lot of libertarians, uh, they think that one solution – this reminds me a little bit of libertarians that think that one solution to our political problem would be term limits. You know, If you just limit the number of terms that a president or a governor or, or, or a congressman can serve, that will fix the problem, which is, of course, complete nonsense. Uh, it's, 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 it's a non-solution to the real problem. Right. 
Okay. And so, uh, likewise, a lot of libertarians think that uh, you should adopt what's called a loser pays rule, right? So, in other words, if I sue you and I lose, then you have to pay me back for my attorney's fees. They think that's the solution to this litigation problem that we have now. Okay. I think they're completely wrong. The reason we have a litigation problem is because law is no longer natural law, and people can sue based upon causes of action that are created uh, or someone's by, feelings the, by the legislature. Hurt. Right. right. And the only kind of loser pays rule that I'm in favor of would be like in the field of patents or copyrights, what I call the losing plaintiff pays. So if I initiate a lawsuit against you, which is analogous to aggression, right, initiating the use of force. Okay. And then if I lose, then I have to compensate the defendant that I sued. That for makes his a cost. lot. That makes a lot of sense. I That's would interesting. be in favor yeah. of that, but I would not be in favor of a general loser pays rule because if someone sues me for patent infringement and I lose because the law is unjust, it would be adding insult to injury, or actually, I guess, adding injury to injury to make me pay for the attorney's fees of the plaintiff after I have to pay him damages that I shouldn't have to pay in the first place. So the loser pays rule could actually double the damages done or magnify the damages done to an innocent person under our current system. So I would only be in favor of a losing plaintiff pays rule. That's very person. interesting. That's a great point. I think it's a great idea because then it would get rid of a lot of people who are so happy. It really would. Yes. I mean, yeah. they have to go in there going, hey, I'm going to win and I'm going to kick some ass. And then uh, there's a chance. Maybe I should. I don't know if I have enough <laughs> yeah, wait a evidence yeah, yeah. against this person to actually go into this and win. And I'll, or if I, I'm aggressive. If, if I had to pay for it at the end of this, I'm not sure I could. Right. I, exactly. I, I, another, another mistake I hear a lot of libertarians is on the issue of, of, well, on intellectual property, which is an extremely complicated issue. Almost no one understands trademark, patent, copyright, and trade secret uh, like a patent lawyer like me does. So they don't understand these things, which I don't, I don't blame them for. I don't understand neuro, neurosurgery either. But they will start commenting that something like, well, I think I'm against copyright, but I'm, I'm for for contractual patents or something like that. They don't know what they're talking about. And then they'll say something like, well, I'm for trademark because I'm against fraud. Now, that little statement I hear all the time by people who don't know a thing about fraud law, contract law, property law, or trademark law, because it, it just doesn't occur to them that, well, we already have a law against fraud. So why would you be for trademark because you're against fraud? Because if there's already a law against fraud, then trademark law is, what is it, like an extra second law against fraud? <laughs> okay, I, I mean, get what you're saying. If, yeah, why right do we too. need trademark to stop fraud if fraud is already illegal? Okay. So trademark has to do something else beyond fraud, and they don't really understand what that is, but they're kind of in favor of trademark law because they think it prevents fraud. Uh, but it's got nothing – it's got literally nothing to do with fraud. Interesting. Tra trademark basically prevents – you from selling something that is confusingly similar to something else, but it doesn't have to actually confuse anyone. It's just deemed to be confusingly similar. Well, I remember like there was this whole thing with the trademark thing where you went to a, a restaurant and you were like, ah, can I get a Coke? And then the waitress was like, oh, we only have Pepsi. And oh, I just wanted a cola. Right. right? Well, well cola is not a Coke. But it was their name. They had to say their names or just like Kleenex. People started calling facial tissue Kleenex. So Kleenex got mad and said, no, you have to call this facial tissue. All right. Because well, you can't. A, 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 yeah. A better restaurant example would be um, the, the happy, well, this is more copyright, but, the, you know, you when you go to restaurants, when they sing happy birthday to someone, they usually sing this kind of concocted happy, happy birthday song. Right, 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 right. And that's, that's right. because the the the, the so-called owners of the copyright song were suing all these companies if they would do that, and so really? they had to get a license. You got They be recently me. they recently lost their copyright in trial, like you know, six months ago or something. So no, yeah. So the that's the happy crazy. the happy wow. birthday song copyright has been basically eviscerated. So now it's like uh, public domain. Now it's, it's legal to domain, sing regular happy birthday. Public domain. Yeah. I think it's legal to do that now. So Interesting. Who wrote that fucking song? It's not that good either. Oh my god! It's, if you read the, if you read the, if you just search a happy birthday copyright case, uh, you, you'll see there's a whole history there. Oh, wow. it's totally confusing. It was it was cribbed from another another older song, some Boy Scouts thing or something like that. Wow. Like the, a long time ago. Was so, it like uh, said somebody came along one day and like, hey, nobody's really copywritten. Happy birthday. I think I'm going to do that. Was it that kind of a thing? 
I think it was something like that. It was it was basically an adaptation of something that had been done before that uh. was never never protected by copyright according to the standards of the time. Wow! And the, you basically had Time Warner, Warner Hell Music, or someone like that, just asserting for decades that they had the copyright. A no major record actually, label, they, huh? They just, That's crazy. They just paid. They, everyone just paid up because it's extortion. That's, finally, someone uh, fought it and they won. That's fucked up. Well, it was like Paris Hilton, didn't she? Copyright a, like a, a phrase or a term or something stupid. She, uh, it, like, oh, uh, that, that, that's so hot. That's something. so hot or something like yeah. that. It's like come and on, that's, and, and that's trademark. That's not copyright. Oh, trademark, it's trademarked. But, okay, yeah. that's her like that's her logo. That's her shtick or her business her catchphrase. Right, right. Anyways, though, this is Johnny Rocket always launching ideas in your direction. And I'm here. We're talking to Stefan Kinsella. Anyways, we'll check him out at stefankinsella.com. We have more of him coming up next. Anyways, I'm here with my co-host, Mr. Kurt Nelson. Thank you, Johnny. Hey, people. Check us out on NWCZ Radio, Fridays, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. And Saturdays, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. NWCZ is an award-winning radio station that has been going strong for years and has become the Pacific Northwest's most popular internet station to date. Great independent music, interviews, and delivering radio to you 24-7. Get the fuck out of here, really? Yeah, 24-7. And my beautiful co-host, Miss Heather Nixon. Thank you. And the Johnny Rocket Launchpad is brought to you by Evergreen Cannabis. From the highs to the lows, we've got you covered. And if you go to Evergreen Cannabis in beautiful Blaine, Washington, mention the Johnny Rocket Launchpad for 15% off your next purchase. Visit them at www.egcannabis.com. We have Rocket Fire coming up. Anyways, those Johnny Rocket launching ideas. We'll be right back. Let me tell you something that really chaps my ass. Hey, I'm Billy Burns, and I'll tell you what really chaps my ass. Let me tell you Billy's rules for libertarianism. So here's society. Everybody wants power and money. And don't tell me you don't. Don't sit there on your ivory tower and tell me, oh, yeah, I just want to be really poor so everybody else can have more. Bullshit. You don't. You would like to have a million bucks and live in Florida or live in SoCal or live in the really nice part of whatever city you live in and have a piss ton of money and have a huge mansion and a Lamborghini. You would. And you'd like to be able to tell everybody what to do, too, because that's how human beings are. (laughs) And I'm sorry, but this is the human condition. I'm like Charlie Chaplin, telling it like it is. There's two ways there. You can take the legitimate route or the illegitimate route. And if you create a social system where there is no legitimate route to wealth and power, people will devise an illegitimate route. They will find La Cosa Nostra or whatever, you know, the the Mexican drug cartels. That's a good example. I mean, look at all the poor people in Mexico. I've been to Mexico City. I've been in the barrio. I've been in Mexico City back in the 80s when it was really rough. I went all over that town. A lot of poor people, a lot of criminals, a lot of gangs, few rich guys living in gigantic houses financed by cocaine. And this is how it is. If you do not give people a legitimate, honest path through capitalism to wealth and power, they will find an illegitimate way and people will get hurt. Secondly, rule number two, institutions. People like to create institutions, societies, organizations, bromides, whatever you want to call them. Any institution that is not specifically tasked with fighting statism will become a tool of the statists. And in some cases, even then will become a tool of the statists. It will get compromised through demagoguery generally or bribery or corruption. So you take something like seemingly innocent thing. Oh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful charitable thing. You'll find it's just some shill for for status bullshit. Rule number three, there are no innocent bystanders. You might think you're just a neutral person standing in your kitchen, peeling your jicama and cutting up your vegetable plate. Well, you're not. You're not. That knife in your hand is regulated. That jicama is regulated. Import tariffs on that thing from Mexico, or it was grown in California, and it was regulated all to hell, and the water used to grow, it was regulated all to hell. You're not an innocent bystander. You're a consumer of statism, or you're fighting statism. You're doing one or the other. If you're doing nothing, you're knuckling under. If you're not standing up and saying, this is bullshit, then you are happily accepting the menial little bribe. 
So you take something like, oh, the Susan Komen run for breast cancer, the pink shirts. Oh, I'm such a happy little yuppie from Kirkland running down the street raising money for something good, good, good. Well, first of all, breast cancer gets about 100 times as much funding as any other disease. And it doesn't kill very many women. Heart disease kills 50 times as many women. But we don't care about that because it hasn't got boobies in it. Well, what about the poor woman having a heart attack? Oh, nobody cares about her. It's not her boobs. And then the money for all this bullshit pink shirt running money gets handed over to some leftist institution who dumps it into political campaigns for a bunch more leftist bullshit. And they just put out some more authoritarian crap. And nobody gets cured of breast cancer. It doesn't save anybody. You see, you're not an innocent bystander. You're not just peeling your jicama and running down the street with your pink shirt on being a nice little yuppie from Kirkland. You are a goddamn shill for the status. Wake the fuck up! And that's what chaps my ass! The Johnny Rocket Launchpad is brought to you in part by Laissez-Faire Books. Laissez-Faire is a French term meaning let them be. It has, for more than a century, referred to the belief that an individual is best equipped to solve their own problems and create a more prosperous society while bureaucratic men Mandates and top-down control tend to make problems worse. Visit Laissez-Faire Books for incredible articles and, of course, books. Check them out at lfb.org. This episode of the Johnny Rocket Launchpad is brought to you by the Liberty Conservative. The Liberty Conservative is an online political magazine devoted to the vision of less government and more liberty in achieving true prosperity for all. They intend to accomplish this by informing and educating their readers on the core values of free markets, limited government, non-interventionalism, and personal freedom through their articles, videos, interviews, and endorsements, and other media. Please visit The Liberty Conservative at www.thelibertyconservative.com. Hi, this is Jason Stapleton, and you're listening to the libertarian rock star Johnny Rocket here on Johnny Rocket's Launchpad. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Johnny Rocket Lunch Pad. And now, here's Johnny! The Johnny Rocket Launchpad always launch on ideas in your direction. The Northwest only rock and roll libertarian radio show. I'm here with my co-host, Mr. Kurt Nelson. That is correct, my brother. The voice of reason, the beautiful Heather. The beautiful Heather Nixon. Did you freak it for a minute? No, it's this brown cow, brown owl thing I was thinking about. <laughs> you said the beautiful, and then you were thinking like, brown, yeah, cow, brown and cow, cow. The beautiful brown, brown. brown. So you were thinking about me, and then yeah. the word cow came into oh. your head. Oh, come on. Uh, that's, that's messed up. I, that's no, wrong. Heather. No milk for that's you. Wrong. you can, <laughs> no milk. That's wrong. No, you can't even buy it or get it oh, for free. Oh, Ouch. oh, oh. Ouch. Anyways, that was Johnny Rocket. We're talking with the awesome Stephen Kinsella. Thank you very much, sir. You can check him out at stephenkinsella.com. He's an anarcho-capitalist. This guy has written tons of intellectual journals and books, and you can check him out at his website. And here's a, what we do, Stephen, is on this segment, it's called Rocket Fire. Rocket Fire. What we do on Rocket Fire is I'm going to ask you, sir, a series of 10 questions. These questions will be politically related, and if you can answer these questions between 30 to 60 seconds, that'd be awesome. Stephen, are you ready to play rocket fire let's go question one should felons be able to vote and own firearms if they are released to the public uh no and yes no one should be able to vote <laughs> should be able to own firearms. <laughs> nice nice right on touche 
Anything else you want to say on that? No, I, I actually think that felons, when they've done their time, they ought to be released back into society and uh, shouldn't be punished anymore. Have another go at it. I, I think you're correct. Question two. What do you think the reason is that we have lower crime than we've ever had? I think it's because we're richer. I think that's basically the answer. We're richer, so there's less need to steal and to be a criminal. You know, people have more more money available to give to charity. And maybe it's because the gun rights have gotten uh, stronger in the U.S. in the last 20, 30 years. Interesting. Question three. Do you think reputations keep people and businesses honest? Absolutely. Although I, I think reputation is an extremely important part of civil society and normal business life. And everyone has their own reputation that affects their fortunes when dealing with others with having friends and joining clubs and getting jobs. But I think that you don't have a right to your reputation. So I'm totally opposed to defamation law, which includes libel and slander. Libel is the written form of defamation. Slander is the oral form of defamation. Those are basically intellectual property type rights, which say that you have a right to your reputation, similar to trademark law. And I think that defamation law, as Rothbard showed in The Ethics of Liberty, is completely 100 percent unlibertarian and unjustified and should be totally abolished. So reputation is important, but you don't have a property right in your reputation. Right on, of course. Question four. Why do you think people donate money to political campaigns? Well, I think that uh, larger donors donate to receive favors down the road. So it's basically a, a quid pro quo. I think that smaller donors do it for the same reason that people vote. They're under the delusion that it's part of their civic obligation or civic duty, and they think they're participating in the process. I think it's ridiculous. It'd be, be better to burn money than to give it to a, a politician. Right <laughs> Question five. Why are price gougers natural monopolies a good thing? I don't like either term. I don't think there's such a thing as a natural monopoly. And I don't believe that you're really gouging. All that means is that you're charging higher when there's higher demand. Just like Uber has this demand pricing for when, you know, the, this pricing that they charge a multiple higher when there's a surge, right. when there's a lot of demand. So I think basically the, the, the benefit of, of a free market is that you can have pricing that reflects supply and demand and people adjust from time to time. Actually, price discrimination would be the most efficient thing of all. If you could charge different buyers a different price, it's just difficult to engage in price discrimination because you don't really know who your buyers are. You have to kind of charge right. a level price most of the time. Sometimes you can find creative ways to engage in price discrimination. So I think price gouging is one of the ways to engage in temporal uh, price discrimination, that is to raise prices temporarily when there's an extraordinarily high demand. And I think there's nothing wrong with that uh, whatsoever. In fact, I think it's good because it helps clear the market and helps make for a more efficient set of transactions. It stops people from hoarding too. Here's another question that kind of goes along the same line, but question six, why are last minute airline tickets so expensive? <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. there. I, I get I could make up an answer, but I don't know exactly the answer. I, I can't have something to do with supply and demand, I imagine. It's because uh, last last minute airplane gasoline costs more. Uh, they're, they're, ah, just, they're just ah, desperate. <laughs> they're just, I'm like, I got to go to Orlando. I got to go to Orlando. <laughs> Question seven. What kind of energy supply should be used instead of gas and coal? Well, I've been a longtime proponent of nuclear power, and I think that in a free market, it would be much more popular. I do agree there's some subsidization going on there by the state of, of our current system. On the other hand, it's heavily regulated, and the right. cost is much higher than it would be. And I also think that if the state or if the legal system appropriately penalized the externalities from from fossil fuels you know the pollution that comes from it then there would be a little bit more cost associated with fossil fuels and so nuclear would be relatively more affordable but i'm a big proponent of fossil fuels as well it, it, having an energy-based society with some pollution is better than having no energy so in a way i agree with ayn rand that you know when you see a smokestack of a fossil fuel plant, you should get on your knees and give, give a little prayer to the smokestack because it's saving us from, from uh, living like animals. I but agree. yeah, I, I'm a big proponent of nuclear. I think that solar solar and the soft energy sources are fine, but I think they're a lot less energy efficient and a lot more polluting than we recognize. And they can never replace the bigger sources of energy like nuclear and, and fossil fuels. I agree. 
Question eight. Do you see the government eventually taking control or full control of the internet? No. And I this is another I like to distinguish government from state. The state is what I oppose. The state to me is the agency of institutionalized aggression. And as a libertarian, I oppose aggression. Government to me is a vague term. Some of us use it to mean uh, the state. Sometimes it means just the governing institutions and society. But no, I don't think the state will or really can take total control of anything. I'm opposed to the state, but I don't think it has unlimited power, which is one reason I'm against libertarians who say they're in favor of limited government, because I don't think it lim- – first of all, all governments or all states are limited because no state is completely totalitarian. There's always limits on what the state can do. So saying you're for limited government is like saying you're for a state of a certain size. So states always have a certain size and a certain limit. So I think the state can never completely control all of life because they have to get by with the consent of the people they're they're basically exploiting. So to do that, they have to sell themselves as providing something of use. So that's why there's propaganda and public education and the government pretends like they're on your side and they're helping protect you from A, B, and C. So I don't think they're going to t- completely take over the internet. And I think that the internet and technology like this the good thing about that is that technology can keep advancing and stay ahead of the government with encryption and with decentralized knowledge with you know, bit torrent type technology and also even blockchain type technology right so i think that the good thing about this kind of technology is that the state will find it harder and harder to to attack it well yeah and you're going to have entrepreneurs who are going to be like how can we fuck this system here you know and they're going to constantly be a couple steps ahead yeah i think there's a there's an expression i heard uh one of the internet pioneers said that you know the the internet looks at the government as damage and just routes routes around it basically <laughs> right exactly <laughs> Question nine. Is pirating movies a victimless crime? Absolutely. In fact, I think it actually helps the so-called victims of it. But if it doesn't, you know, there's nothing wrong with copying information whatsoever. It's not just that it's not unlibertarian to copy things because copyright is wrong. There's nothing. It's, there's no crime being committed. It's not even immoral. I think there's nothing whatsoever wrong with copying information that's in the public domain, that's out there in the public, however you see fit. I think Lysander, uh, Benjamin Tucker, who was one of Lysander Spooners, he li- lived around that time, another anarchist libertarian, he said it best. He said that if you want if you want to keep your information to yourself, keep it to yourself. But if you start revealing information to the world, then you, you can't really complain if people copy it, learn from it, talk about it, etc. So uh, piracy is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Question 10. Does someone have free speech on someone? else's property yeah this is one of these um the short answer is in a way is no but the question is framed this way quite often by libertarians and they think of land as a special thing like you're on land this is why i asked you yeah and the and the person who is on the land the person who owns the land that you're on gets to set the rules so to speak i'm not so sure that's right that if i enter someone's property to get a, a wayward frisbee or a softball or if I am invited to a dinner party that they have the right to blow my head off just because they own the property and they can set the rules. It just doesn't follow like that. The basic We have to keep in mind the basic libertarian idea is that we're against aggression, which means basically invading the borders of someone's body without their permission. And just because I'm quote unquote on your property doesn't mean that I'm committing aggression and you can blow my brains out if you feel like it. I agree. So we ha- we have to be careful saying that the owner of property can set the rules for what happens on that property. So that said, I would say that you don't have a right to free speech in general. Anyway, there is no right to free speech. There's only a right to do whatever you want to do so long as you don't commit aggression against someone else. That is, use someone else's resources without their permission. Okay. So right. in general, speech doesn't do that, which is why we recognize that free speech – the speech is generally not going to be an act of aggression and can't be prohibited or treated like it's an act of aggression. But it can be in some cases. So, for example, you know, if President Truman, if, if Hitler orders the killing of a bunch of uh, Jewish people or gays, right? You know, just because he's using speech doesn't mean he's immune from liability. In, in my view, now a lot of libertarians who have a kind of so-called purist view of, of free speech actually say that. You know, Hitler's defense in the Nur- in the Nuremberg tri- trials should have been something like, "Don't blame me. I just gave orders." Right. <laughs> <You know>? right. <laughs> but there was authority behind those orders, and it was a little different. Well, that's just another way of saying that sometimes speech can play a causal role in aggression. Just like if I say, "Ready, aim, fire" to a firing squad that I'm in command of, right? Or, right. or if I get on a jury 
on, on the witness stand in a trial and I lie and I say that, yeah, this guy raped my sister and I saw it and the jury believes me and the, and the system executes this guy or puts him in jail when he's innocent. I think my, my speech act played a causal role in the aggression done to him and I'm liable for that. So you can imagine cases where speech can result in um, in aggression being done to someone, and in those cases, I think you shouldn't have the right to do that. But that's because it's a type of action. Okay. So, but in general, I think if you're on someone else's property, you don't have the right to use their property in a way that they don't consent to. So I would think that if I'm in, if I'm invited to someone's home or their business, right, and the rule is announced that certain types of speech are not permitted there. If I do that, then I can be ejected. But I can be ejected any anyway at any time by the owner if they just change their mind because it's their property. So I don't really think that means free speech is limited. I just think it means people that own resources are entitled to use them as they see fit, and they're entitled to invite people to use them temporarily, and they're entitled to change their mind and to revoke that permission when they want to. Anyway, so that's Rocket Fire with Stephen Kinsella. Well done, man. Well done. Yeah. Bam! Thank Good you. job. Thank you. That was pretty fast. Pastor from Louisiana. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm from L.A. When I lived in yeah, Alabama, I'm from the we, other LA. That's right. The other LA. Right. When I lived in Alabama, I always say I'm from LA, Lower Alabama. And now you could say that you're from Louisiana too, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We 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 write slowly, but we expect people will read us more quickly than we write. Got to take a quick commercial break, and now a word from our sponsors. Do you know why you should take the trip to Blaine, Washington, Sun, beaches, glorious mountain views? Oh, and weed. Blaine is home to the premier recreational marijuana store, Evergreen Cannabis. Whether you're looking for flower, pre-rolls, edibles, or concentrates, Evergreen Cannabis' knowledgeable and friendly staff will help you find the exact product to suit all of your needs. The Evergreen Cannabis store offers an atmosphere that is comfortable and relaxed so you'll always feel at home, overlooking Blaine Harbor and sitting right next to the Canadian border. Find your bliss at Evergreen Cannabis, 922 Peace Portal Drive in Blaine, Washington. For more info, call 360-332-8922 and visit their website at egcannabis.com. Mention the Launchpad for 15% off any regularly priced item. Our products have intoxicating effects and may be habit forming. Marijuana can impair concentration, coordination, and judgment. Do not operate a vehicle or machinery under the influence of this drug. There may be health risks associated with the consumption of this product. For use by adults 21 and older, keep out of the reach of children. So, Stefan, like as far as the free speech goes, what is, you know, the slander results in harming your reputation? And let's say somebody says someone's a pedophile, completely makes it up, but they lose their job, they can't get another one. And it hurts them financially, and you know they lose their house. Is does that in a, does that count? She, can someone go after them uh, legally to sue them if they cause them financial harm? I don't think so because the harm that's done to the people in those cases is harm that that they didn't have a right not to have happen to them. So if someone doesn't give you a loan, for example, you didn't have a right to the loan in the first place. So the lender has the right to not give you money for whatever reason they want. If they want to rely upon the advice of a of a slanderer, they have the right to do that. Okay, so that that would be how I analyze that. But I I would say that you know in a world where there was no defamation law then people wouldn't put as much stock into what people said because they know there's no defamation law. Right now, if someone accuses someone else of being a child molester and the victim of that charge doesn't doesn't file a defamation lawsuit, everyone assumes that he's actually guilty of it because if he really was innocent, he Good would point. have filed a defamation lawsuit. So in a world where there's no defamation law at all, the okay. failure of me to legally do something about it doesn't have any implications. So people would be, I think, more skeptical of public claims, and they would rely more upon the private reputation of the speaker. So someone who has a reputation for, for making scandalous charges like the Southern, the Southern Poverty Law Center, right, which calls calls everyone who, who doesn't think Israel should rule the world an anti-Semite, you know, right. they, they just would be laughed out of court all the time. And I mean the court of public opinion. So th their charges would carry – very little weight. So defamation law actually helps give more weight right now to to charges of, that people are bigots or racist, et cetera, because otherwise they would they would countersue for defamation. 
Right. But so, it's not always worth it to do that now. So what you're saying is if you don't do anything, you're already, you're guilty. If you have, you take no action, most the public court or the people would therefore assume, well, he ain't saying anything and he's quiet and he's just kind of sitting in his house and he's kind of hiding from everyone. Yep. He must yep. be guilty. Yeah. It's, it's very because he has the right to sue. Like if he's really innocent, truth is a defense to a defamation case. So if he's really innocent, why isn't he suing these people for defamation? libel or slander why isn't he suing them it, it's almost like when someone is accused of a horrible murder and they don't take the witness stand because they have the right to under the fifth amendment right and you're not you're not supposed to infer anything from that normal people watching go well i don't know i think if i was totally innocent and i was accused i probably would take the stand and explain what the hell happened and why i'm innocent right and the fact that this guy doesn't makes me think maybe he's got something to hide he's got the right sure. to hide it but it makes me it makes me suspect that he's hiding something and something similar happens when someone doesn't defend themselves under today's legal system when they're charged or when they're accused of something heinous because they have a right to file a lawsuit against it now. In, in a free society, uh, you wouldn't have a right to sue someone for defamation because people have the right to lie basically, and other people have the right to rely upon people's lies in doing business with you. I mean like so that's – If we read the National Enquirer – Right. We know that's all bullshit. We know they lie. It's an entertainment. It's yellow journalism. It's it's funny. It's entertainment. But nobody believes that. How has a crazed woman forced Betty Davis to ask for court protection and wiring mind want to know? I want to know. When does a common cold need a doctor's attention? This week's National Enquirer tells you what surprising foods are really fattening. Why is walking as good for your health as jogging? It's in the Enquirer. It's just there for that. I think there are people that some people that do. Maybe they do. And they listen Maybe to... Some People um, who are not to George Nori at night, and thoroughly all together, UFOs, and yeah. But again, I mean, same thing though. I think we all know it's a non credible news source, so we wouldn't probably believe them. Yeah, but I think Heather's got uh, there's a good point there in that there, you could reach certain lines where the speech rises to a level where it is aggression. So, like, if you, you, know, you see an angry lynch mob out looking for the black guy who allegedly raped some white woman. And, sure. you know, you, you, you saw Chicken George just run by you're, and you don't like him for some reason. And you, you tell the mob, I just saw him go over there and I saw him do it. And, you, you know, you kind of like stoke up the fears of this mob and you get this guy killed. Right. I, I could see in a case like that. But but the difference is in that case, the, the lynch mob didn't have a right to to hang this guy. So his rights were violated when he was when he was lynched in the in the cases we were discussing earlier. If someone doesn't do business with you. They're not violating your rights because you don't have a right to for them to do business with you. If, right. if someone does wants to stop stop going to Chick Fil A because the owner is a Christian who doesn't open their stores on Sundays and doesn't support uh, gay marriage, you know they have the right to not patronize the business. That is true. That is true. What is your subjective view of anarcho capitalism, and how is that different from any other forms of anarchy? I personally use the word anarcho libertarianism. Okay, mostly now because. I do think that, well, the left libertarians have somewhat succeeded in demonizing the word capitalism, which I don't agree with them on this. Okay. But I, they have a germ of a point in that the, the way the Randians use the word capitalism as a synonym for libertarianism I think is a little bit of a stretch. I do think that in any advanced cosmopolitan society that has a free market, you would tend to have capitalism arise. But capitalism is just one one aspect of the economic aspect of a libertarian society. So to use it as a stand-in for the entire thing is it's it's like metonymy almost. The, you know the, the it's you know like saying someone's hitting the bottle using the bottle to refer to drinking. Sure. It's it's a, it's a stand-in, and I don't have a big problem with it. But I think that a free society is more than just about the way the e the economy is ordered, and it's more than about the particular way that capital is owned. Although I do I do think that any free market society would be heavily capitalist. But so in, so that said, so I usually use anarcho-libertarian. I use it to distinguish people that say they're against the state, but they're not for a private property order in the free society that would emerge in the absence of the state. Because I don't think they're actually literally anarchists. Because if you don't have private property being respected on a system on a on a society-wide basis, right, you're not going to have libertarian justice, and you're not going to you're really going to have not get rid of the state. You're perpetuating and, and, the state. 
And I think all, the other point is we have to recognize that libertarians – I think all consistent libertarians should be anarchists, not only anarchists. In other words, we're anarchists because we're against aggression, but that means we're against both – Private aggression, which is you know normal criminal actions, and aggression that's committed by agencies or institutions, right? Which is basically the state. So we're right. against the state because we're against aggression, but that means we're also against private aggression. So I believe if we got rid of the state, then we would get rid of one huge source of aggression, but you would still have to worry about private aggression being being perpetrated on people. And if you don't have private property rights being respected, you still have widespread aggression being done just because people's property rights aren't being respected. So I think as libertarians, as anarchist libertarians, we have to oppose private crime, and that means we support private property rights, and we have to oppose state crime as well. Well, what I find is funny is uh, here, here in Seattle, we have a thing called May Day, which is May 5th, and we have all these riots, and we have these so-called anarchists, which are ANCOMs, I've never once seen an anarcho-capitalist or an anarcho-libertarian out there throwing bottles and breaking windows. Why? I have never heard of any of that. And Smashing at least, and looting the, the looting. Mom, it's little just mom disgusting. and pop stores. And it's like, and this is bullshit. And this is not, I mean, obviously as an anarcho-libertarian or anarcho-capitalist, uh, we would obviously value those people's property and value their rights to own their property. Or respect it anyway. And, and at least respect it. This is the big problem. And I think there's that is the huge difference. I mean, exactly. It shows exactly where they where they stand. They break windows. They do all this shit. You're just an asshole. You're just a dick. <laughs> You're a dick. You know. But, yeah, well, uh, and a lot of left libertarians are against corporations because they have this belief that Corporations are creatures of the state. Um, okay. and I've, I've written and talked on this too, and you can you can you can Google it. But I think that's that's another libertarian fallacy: the idea that without the government, without the state, without state laws on this matter, you wouldn't have corporations. I mean, you you would have firms organized in a way similar to what corporations, the way corporations are organized now. So I think you would have business agency entities that are they're basically corporations. Yeah, but they wouldn't have the protection of the state. Well, they wouldn't. But I think that. The fallacious view is that corporations have some kind of special privilege from mm -hmm. the state that they wouldn't have in a free market. And the, the, the fallacy there is the idea that every shareholder that's so-called an owner of the corporation's assets – would be have unlimited liability for every tort, every wrongdoing done by an employee of that corporation absent the state. And I think that's the fallacy. That's actually wrong. I don't think that shareholders would or ought to have liability for the actions performed by other people unless you can show a good reason for it. And just because they have a share in the corporation or because they gave money to the corporation or because they can vote for the board of directors in an annual meeting doesn't mean that they're any more liable for the actions of someone else than a creditor of that corporation or an employee of that corporation or a customer of that employee of that corporation right i see where you're going i 100 so, agree so, so in other words the state does give shareholders liability from unlimited unlimited liability from torts of employees of that corporation but they shouldn't have liability in the first place and so it's not really a special privilege the state is given okay, okay i get you Anyway, so this is Johnny Rocket. Do you have any websites or anything else you want to promote for us, sir? No, sir. Promote your own website. You've done enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so check them out at StephanKinsella.com. <laughs> StephanKinsella, K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A.com. Check them out. Awesome stuff. He has some great videos on there, great articles that he's written. Thank you very much, Stephan, for being on the Johnny Rocket Long Show. I appreciate it. Thanks, Heather Kurt, Johnny. Thank you. Yeah. Give yeah. it up for Stephan Kinsella. Anyways, so it's Johnny Rocket always launching ideas in your direction. Kurt, you got anything? Yeah, you know what? I do. And thanks for asking. I have one thing to say. Libertarianleadership.org. <laughs> Motivate, educate, activate. We are an organization founded by Libertarian Party members to specifically train and coach Libertarians. Sign up for a free subscription to the Libertarian Leader newsletter and receive a free digital copy of Libertarian Leadership, the book, exclamation point. You're reading that, right? You're no, that. I had that memorized. Okay. And the beautiful voice of reason, Heather Nixon. Thank you, Johnny. And you know what? Did you know that the Johnny Rocket Launchpad is Liberty? No! And each week we strive to bring you the best guests in talk radio. Really? 
What? Yeah. The Johnny Rocket Launchpad delivers weekly interviews of noteworthy politicians, experts, and activists. Stefan's noteworthy. That's right. It sure is. The Johnny Rocket Launchpad is always bringing the party to the Libertarian Party. We are. Party and down. launching ideas in your direction. We are. And anyway, so it's Johnny Rocket. Guys, thank you very much. This is episode... Is it 97? God, three away from 100. Anyways, so thank you guys very much. Always launching ideas. See you next week.